three, two, one. Welcome to the System and Soul podcast, a place for founders and entrepreneurs to discover breakthrough in their business. I'm Benj Miller, fellow founder, business coach, and your host. This is your place to gain clarity and control as you lead through the challenges you face every day in your business. Running a business is just hard, so we're bringing you the conversations with people who are figuring it out, have figured it out, to help you find breakthrough. Welcome to the System and Soul podcast. What's up, System and Soul? Benj Miller, your host, back here for another episode. Today is really fun. We've got Laura Gallagher on here. She's a PhD. She's written a, a book or two, has a consulting practice. She's a keynote speaker, TED Talks. I, I started following her on LinkedIn with some of her content that I really resonated with, reached out to her, invited her on the podcast. I had no idea where this conversation was going to go. Uh, but I really enjoyed it. I think you will too. You'll hear some themes that she brings up that we've had on the show before, uh, some different language around it, but some very helpful, practical steps that all of us can take to be the leaders that we want to be. So I hope you enjoy. Uh, here's my conversation with Laura. Laura, welcome to the conversation. You came highly recommended, so I'm looking forward to getting to know you a little bit in the work that you do. So as always, we got to start off with what is one crazy, ungoogleable fact about Laura? I would say it is my musical proclivity. So I actually have played six instruments over the course of my life. I only play two currently, but there's not much out there on the Googs about my musicality. <laughs> what are the two that you stuck with? Um, piano and guitar. Yes, classic. Yeah. Um, I learned how to play two songs on a piano really well so that I could walk into like a, a hotel bar and you That's know, win over the ladies. Two songs, what are the songs? mic drop. Uh, Wind Beneath My Wings, a little oh, Bette okay. Miller. And <laughs> um, what was the other one? Uh, Maybe I Will Always Love You by Whitney Houston. Wow. Yeah, so no, wait, those do you are my sing two. As well? No, no, nobody wants me singing ever. No, no, no. You're just you're just inviting the women over to sing while you accompany yeah. them. Is this the yeah, game? it's pretty yeah. good. I'm yeah. impressed. I mean, <laughs> I've been married for 24 years, so I haven't used that in a long time. <laughs> um, all right, so this will be fun. Um, give us a quick little overview of what you do. Um, tell us about the book you've written, and then we'll dive into the top three things that are on your mind. Sounds good. So I apply the science of human behavior to organizations. So my background is organizational psychology, right? Now, psychology, that's just understanding, explaining, and predicting behavior. So organizational psychology takes that and says, how do we do that in the context of the workplace? And, you know, it's a flawed science like they all are, but there's actually quite a bit that we know about how humans think and feel and interact. And so we work with leaders to teach them the science of human behavior and how they can put it to use, not only to really make the organization say, you know, more profitable and more effective, but also make it a better place to work. So the employees yeah. feel like they're more who they truly are. They feel like they're being fully utilized. They feel seen and appreciated and all of that. Yeah. So put in other words, you apply it to both the system and the soul of the business. Oof, exactly. <laughs> no, perfect. <laughs> Sorry, that was a little, that was a little self-righteous plug softball. there. Uh, I sort of loud that yeah. out for you. <laughs> yeah, I appreciate that. So in your, in your world, this will be super fascinating. What are the, you know, what's top of your mind that you're learning, wrestling with, challenging others with? Yeah. Well, I think the biggest thing that's been top of mind for me lately is this idea of like transformational leadership. I mean, it's been around for a long time, this idea, at least in my geeky world of industrial organizational psychology, it's been around for a long time, but I, I'm hearing about it so much from organizations, right? Where, where leaders are not only wanting to embody that for themselves, but they're wanting to cultivate that kind of transformational leadership in the levels of leadership below them. Um, but I think it's, I think it's kind of misunderstood. 
Um, yeah, I was going to say, what does that even mean? <laughs> well, I mean, there's there's elements to what truly makes transformational leadership transformational versus, say, transactional. And there's like a whole bunch of them. And I don't want to get into like the, the jargony nature of it. But the simplest way that I, I invite people to think about transformational leadership is it's really not about what you do. It's about who you are. Yeah. And so there's two pieces of it to me. Part of it is the transformation that the leader, him or herself, goes through, right? And really stepping into that kind of role, taking that on. But then it's also about who each person is invited to be in their presence. And I think that true transformation really happens for people at an individual level and then a team level and then an organizational level when they're invited to actually be more truly authentic and step into spaces that might normally be uncomfortable. Yeah. Vulnerability. Yeah. Yeah. No, a hundred percent. This is a, a common thread in our conversations on here when we dive yeah. into what, what makes a great leader, a great leader. We use different language, but the same, yeah. the same principles it comes back to. So how, yeah. how have you found that, that journey for you to step into, um, is, is so long. It's a, it is a, it is a long process. There's not like a workshop we can go to and right. boom. So how, how, what does it look like for you? Like, where do you hack people to start in that process? Yeah. So first of all, I just have to share with you this um, tattoo on my wrist, right? Which is journey <laughs> because, and no, it's not the band, the not wrist the band. tattoo over on this wrist, um, not the band, but it, you know, this, this, Journey tattoo is something that I got about four years ago as a reminder to myself that like a couple things. One, the journey is all we have and it's never over. So for me personally, one of the things that I noticed in my twenties is that I had this artificial destination in mind all the time. Yes. This idea yeah. that I was going to arrive, that I was going to get there. Um, and that as was soon important. as fill in the blank, yes, as soon as I exactly. get married, get the house, get the promotion, right. whatever. 100%, 100%. Yep. Because it's such a, it, it feels kind of so good in the moment, right? And then five minutes later, you're like, okay, well, now what? Um, yep. But this idea even of, you know, transformational leadership and the journey, like you're saying, like it's it's a long journey. Yeah, it never ends. It is a, it's really, it's always about, you know, who are you becoming? Who are you in this moment? But who are you becoming? Right. Yeah. So where do people start? So my favorite place to start is with a self-acceptance practice. And I think, so self-acceptance is one of my favorite things in the world to talk about. I think it's one of the most misunderstood. I think self-acceptance terrifies people because they don't quite grok what it is and they have a lot of misconceptions about what it means for them if they practice self-acceptance. So set us straight. This is yeah. your opportunity to set the whole world straight on self-acceptance. <laughs> on self-acceptance. And I'm I'm all ears and intrigued. Okay, good. All right. So so first of all, it is a practice. Just like, you know, the transformational leadership journey is a journey. Self-acceptance is a constant practice. It's also not a destination that you ever arrive at. And most human beings go through waves of finding it easier or harder to accept themselves in a moment, depending on what's going on and what their thoughts and their feelings are. But self-acceptance, the shortest way to capture that is being genuinely okay with everything about who you are right now without changing anything. So it's, it's getting rid of that as soon as I, yeah, right. Fill in the yep, blank. As absolutely. soon as I hit that milestone, then, you know, once I buy that house, then I'll be enough. You know, once I get a raise, then I'll finally feel like I've arrived. Like those those things are artificial and we know that, but we often cling to them anyway. Yeah, and we keep thinking absolutely. that's going to be the answer. Uh, but self-acceptance freaks people out. They think it means being complacent. They yes. Self-acceptance, right? Is that kind right, of what comes up right. for you? Yeah, I think I, I've long make sure that I di distinguish between complacent and content, mm. right? Those are mm -hmm. like... They feel the same, but they're worlds apart. And I can be content without being complacent. Yes. I love that. So for you, when you're in that space of content, what's the key difference between like content and 
complacent? What do you notice? Um, my, my go-to tool is just gratitude because uh-huh. there's uh, whatever that lie is of the next thing. Yeah. Uh, if you stop and go, wait a minute, let's look around like awesome marriage, awesome kid, you know, like list off all of the amazing things and go to a place of gratitude. And even, even in our, you know, one of the hardest lessons of, of self-leadership is, is truly appreciating the gift of a challenge and a heart, mm-hmm. like an obstacle and <laughs> this, whatever that thing is, that is the next thing, yeah. appreciating being in the season of the before you get there. So yes. it, it, to me, it all comes back to, to gratitude. I think most leaders that do an amazing job they spend their emotional energy on gratitude and possibility. Mm. And then they give that to other people. Kind of like you were saying, you know, it starts with themselves and then who are you inviting into the conversation? So, so the, the, uh, I'm going to invite you in gratefully. I'm glad you're here. Uh And I'm also going to see the possibility in you as a person and pull the best out of you. And it doesn't mean I'm not okay with who you are right now. It's just, wow, there's some possibility there of, of what could be next. Oh, so many good threads. I love what you're talking about here. So many good threads. So, um, okay. I'm going to, I'm going to take note of something that I want to come back to. Um, and I want to share when you talked about, you know, the difference between like complacent and contentment, I want to add something for me. So when I, when I am content with who I am right now, when I'm practicing that self-acceptance, I think a lot of people assume that means that I'm not going to improve. It's like, oh, well, if you're, if you're just okay, if you're okay with yourself, then how are you going to grow? How are you going to develop? They yep. convince themselves. They have to be so hard on themselves. They have to beat themselves up in order to move to that next level, to learn and grow. But these are actually two completely different spectrums. So the opposite of self-acceptance is isn't self-improvement. Those aren't opposite ends of the continuum. The opposite right. of self-acceptance is self-judgment. Yes. Right? Yeah. And then you've got self-improvement on a different spectrum where you can be really high on that. Or if you're really low on that, then yeah, you would be complacent. You would be like stagnant. You know, I'm not yeah. learning and growing. So I always invite people to really think of it as a like a two by two matrix, really. And yeah. I that's what I was picturing in my head as yes, you're saying, oh, good, you're good. T- every, everything in life comes back to a two by two matrix. Got to be a two by two. I mean, I'm, I'm a consultant at heart, right? So it's got to be a two by two. Yeah. Um, but, but that's really what it is. And recognizing that, wait a second, these things coexist. I actually can be totally okay with exactly who I am right now and still feel super driven to grow and develop and improve. And that's actually where the healthiest people hang out. Yeah, you know, that's the quadrant that I want to be in as often as I can. You know, it's interesting because I, I'm, you know, pretty driven. I'm around a lot of driven people, and so I'm intrigued by people that aren't driven because yeah. they're they're not necessarily my people, and I don't understand that. But I've learned that people that that drive naturally creates a lack of um, of contentment. In a lot of people. So some of the happiest people I know are some of the least driven people that I know. And I Mm. think it's because of what we're talking about. They're not, they're okay with now and not even needing that other thing to push and push and push. Um, So they're more, they're more fun to be around. They're more relational. They're more present in the moment. Um, So I'm challenged by that personally. But that really speaks to, I think, the beauty of what you were saying before, because I I think it's really just a matter of learning how to have that level of happiness and contentment while while still growing. And you can do at whatever pace. And, you know, not everybody has to drive the same degree, but exactly to, to come back to some of your threads. Right. If people are genuinely excited and grateful for a challenge, if it you know, if I come across an obstacle and I'm like, oh, man, you know, this sucks and I'm just getting down on it, then yeah, that's not a very fun process. But if I can recognize the joy of the challenge, then I, I think it is possible to have yeah. that like happier vibe and you don't have to be happy all the time, but just to have that more like energized, you know, active vibe in pursuit of whatever it is that you're going for. That's right. And there's, um, 
Okay, so did you ever watch the old Twilight Zone? No. Okay. I, I've, I've seen a handful of episodes, but there is an episode that was profound for me where a, I think he's like a crook in the beginning of the episode and he, he dies. And then he meets with, you know, a seemingly an angel. And basically the angel says, you know, just whatever it is that you want, just imagine it and it will be here. And so he starts to just imagine all the things that he wants, you know, he, he wants to go to the casino and he wants to win. So he wins and he wants to be surrounded by beautiful women. So there's beautiful women. And he just, you know, like life is great and everything that he wants, he's getting it, he's getting it. And as the episode goes on, he's starting to become maybe a little bit disenchanted. Right. And he, he imagines a pool table. Cause he's like, okay, I'll, I'll play a game of pool. He racks the balls. And when he goes to break, every ball goes in the hole and he's like so frustrated because there's no fun there's mm. no challenge there's no joy he's getting all the things he wants but there's no struggle and so he's starting to lose his mind and then you know this seeming angel comes back and he's like you know what is this you know i thought that heaven was supposed to be great and he said well whoever said that you were in heaven oh wow yeah, it's like that is a, that is a powerful metaphor, isn't it? So good. I love that yeah. episode so much, and I think it's it speaks to such truth. If we never struggled, if we didn't feel any challenge in the things that we were working for and accomplishing, like what is the fun of that? But we forget yeah. that sometimes. Sometimes the challenge is just harder than we want it to be, or it's lasting longer than we want, or we're struggling to manage our emotions and our mood throughout the process, and we just want it to be over, but. This is the stuff of life, you know, like, yeah. Really want. So is it, is this too bold of a statement for me to recap what you're saying as the starting place for transformational leadership is truly with self-acceptance? I love Is that, that too big of a statement? I don't think so. Okay. I, I, I think that's, I think that's so key because that self-acceptance, you know, so far we've just been talking about how it coexists with self-improvement, but the other truth is that self-acceptance accelerates growth, first of all. Research has shown this time and again, when people are primed to be practicing self-acceptance, they actually learn and grow faster than when they're not, and they're falling back to the default of self-judgment. So we are opening our minds more to be able to learn and grow, which is obviously necessary to improve. Yeah. Um, yeah. And we're creating space for introspection, which is huge, huge for transformational leadership. I think most leaders, well, I think masterful leaders already introspect. I think they do that. But most of the, the leaders that I meet are still really hard on themselves. And they're almost like badge of honor. Nobody's harder on me than me. Yes. Yes. Right? Yes. And they miss, they miss what happens in that dynamic. So let's just say that, you know, you made a mistake with something, you know, it's not the end of the world, but you make a mistake and you come to me to let me know. And I say to you, like, seriously, God, what is wrong with you? You know better. Ooh. Next time you make a mistake, are you more likely to come tell me or less likely? Yeah, no. Probably less, right? But we, we talk this way to ourselves. And what we miss is that actually we start to build up our own walls in our own mind and our own heart. And we actually begin to hide things from ourselves. So learning how to build that relationship with yourself, because that is self-acceptance. What is my relationship with? Yeah. yeah. How do I talk to myself? How do I treat myself? Do I talk to me the way that I would talk to your best friend? If I don't do that, then that relationship, like I, I'm actually going to struggle with my introspection. I'm going to miss. Yeah. You're dece it. you're going to start deceiving your, yourself, right? Yeah. Yeah. And so self-acceptance not only accelerates self-improvement, which is ne definitely necessary for that journey of transformational leadership, but it accelerates the process of growing self-awareness. And because transformational leadership isn't about what you do, it's about who you are. You, you want to get to know yourself. You want to know yourself pretty fully. You want to know the parts yeah. of yourself that you've struggled to accept. You want to learn how to 
process through that. So there's a lot of feeling stuff. This is where I get to be like, okay, I'm a psychologist, can't get mad. But you know, when I'm working <laughs> with leaders, I'm like, yo, I'm gonna ask you to feel some stuff. We're gonna feel. Yeah. We don't wanna suppress yeah. that. We gotta work through that. Last year I took one of those big fancy 360 assessments. And Ooh. so a bunch of other people took it. And one of the things that I found was interesting is as I'm answering it, I was less concerned with how other people scored me. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, I got a low score on that. Yeah, that's obvious. I suck at that. Mm -hmm. I was more concerned with what if I have an overly optimistic view of myself in this area and there's a wide the, the gap was what scared me, not a low score, but the gap between what yeah. I thought and what they thought. Mm -hmm. So that, I mean, that's why it's vulnerable. That's why it's helpful, yeah. all those things. But it was, it was interesting to notice that happening inside me as I was going through that process. Absolutely. I mean, that's good. That means that you're, you're wanting to really hone your attention on, you know, blind spots. Yeah. Which I think yeah. is good. I have a question. Was the 360 anonymous or did you know who was saying? Um, so it was, I think there were 20, 40, 60, I forget how many, um, multiple choice type questions in there. Uh -huh. And those ended up pretty anonymous. They got put in buckets, like your boss, yeah. your peers, your, mm -hmm. you know, direct reports. Um, but they were anonymous within those buckets. And then there were a couple write in questions and it was kind of easy to figure out who wrote what on those. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I mean, so I used to administer 360 um, surveys. It's actually when I worked for NASA at Kennedy Space Center, I actually worked to bring it in for influence leaders. And I've actually shifted away from them very heavily and haven't done them in many years. To something else or? Yes. Well, really the, what I, what I don't like about them now, and, and I'll, I will say they can have utility and they can be used in a way that leads to healthy growth, right? So I don't mean to be dogmatic or black and white about it. I just personally have found that there can be, especially for the leaders who really will really benefit from getting the feedback, there's a tremendous amount of turmoil and distrust that forms as an initial reaction to anonymous feedback. Mm. Um, and so if I give you feedback, that tells you more about me then it tells you about you. There's always, there's always that filter. Always, always. And, and it's a useful filter. It's not a filter to dismiss. That doesn't mean like, oh, well, that's just you. Like, that's not the point. Yeah. Like, if I, right, if I want feedback from you, then theoretically, I care about you. I care about our relationship. How well we work together matters to me. So just because you giving me feedback is, it tells me more about you than it tells me about me, doesn't make it irrelevant. It makes it super relevant. It tells me what you value, what you want, yep. how you experience me, like how you experience me isn't an absolute truth. That's how you experience me. And that's a combination of you and me. So when you start to do 360s, I, I mean, I am a data geek in a lot of ways. So I think it can be really cool to be like, oh, like, what are the trends? Or like, oh, look how much agreement there is here. But I'm just such a psychologist, really, like on a human level, you know, when two people can have an open conversation about what's working well between us and what is it that I want from you and what is it that you want from me and how do we have that dialogue to improve yeah. and grow? I think there's so much more strength in that kind of approach, but it's vulnerable and people need to build the trust and they have to learn the skill to be able to communicate in a way that they are heard and they're yeah. expressing it with self accountability. Yeah. Yeah. That's so good. I, we might not get to three things because I want to ask oh. you another. We're going to keep <laughs> going deep. We're about multiple things in here. <laughs> we're, yeah, that's right. We'll figure out what the three are in retrospect. <laughs> what um, <laughs> when, when we talk about self-acceptance, um, what, like, what's the practical exercise kind of what, what does that look like to start engaging in growing that muscle? Yeah. So um, I could give you, you know, one tactical thing. I could give you three tactical things. Do you want me to limit it or do you want a, a list? I am ready for whatever you got. <laughs> okay, I'll start with one that is um, perhaps the simplest 
as a practice, which is taking credit. So taking credit doesn't mean stealing credit, right? Taking credit is the counterpart to the inner critic that's constantly pointing out your mistakes and your flaws and the things that you haven't done well and done right or what you could have done more. The champion voice, right, in contrast with the critic voice, is the one that says, you know what, I I want to take credit actually for, for doing this thing because historically that's something that I have struggled with and I recognize this is a step in the direction that I want to go. This is progress that I am going to let myself feel good about. So like my team does a morning check-in channel on Slack and every day has a different theme. So we have Take Credit Tuesday. So, okay. <laughs> and I want, I want my team doing this every day, but every Tuesday I'm like, yo, it's Take Credit Tuesday. What do you take credit for today? And one of the rules is there's nothing too small to take credit for. Um, my reaction to that, like that hit me like a ton of bricks because literally this morning I was talking, I was praising our, or the success, the, the momentum our organization is having at the moment. And I literally followed that up with, but I take none of the credit. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so that, that hit me like a ton of bricks. Cause I think, um, oh, wow. um, I, I so want to empower other people that I so often minimize myself. Yeah. Wow. So, all right. Thanks for my free therapy. What's number two? Wait, 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 wait. Are we done with that? Cause I want to know what could you take credit for? What do you take credit for? Not none of it. Yeah. I mean, you, you know, there's, there's a lot of decisions that gets made. There's a lot of strategy in what we're, what we're approaching. There's a lot of the... notice the passive voice, notice the we language. I'm asking you about you. <laughs> you make decisions. Man, that's so hard. Oh, see, look yes. how hard it is, right? It is so hard for me. Yeah. I am, I am, um, collaborative in nature with my, mm -hmm. with, even with the decision-making. Um, so, but the, um, you know, what we've created is pretty special. Yes. We, sorry, I'm working on it, but I'll, I'm adding my, at least I'm part of the, we that's, that's it. progress. And, it, and it's, it's an, and it's an, and right. So the practice of taking credit is not to diminish the contributions of others and allowing yourself to feel good about how you've shown up or what you've done does not remove the collaborative nature of the success. Yeah. It's very yeah. much an and. Um, I have one client who made it a really big habit to talk very openly in front of her organization about, about taking credit, about why it was important as a practice, um, why she was doing it, because it's, it's vulnerable, actually. To say, here's what I take credit for. It's actually vulnerable because of all of the potential judgment that you could get. Yeah. Right. Somebody might go, you take credit for that. You think that's enough? Like it's a vulnerable practice, which is part of why there's so much growth from it. I love but that's. She, this is a kind of a new idea for me. And I'm, it's, yeah. yeah, that's I really like cool. It. Okay. So that's, that's, and that's something that, you know, if anybody listening wants to build a habit or a practice of self-acceptance, I would say every, every day, just find one thing to take credit for. And I will add that as somebody who probably still identifies as an overachiever, but historically 100% identified as an overachiever. The things that I would take credit for were often like, you know what? I take credit for the fact that I didn't work this weekend. Yeah. I would take credit for that. I would take credit for letting myself rest because historically I wouldn't give myself that rest and I could feel this is me growing. Yes. To give myself time away. I understand that. So it's not always taking credit for like crushing it. You know, you can take credit for any little thing. Take credit. Yeah. I can take credit for working out. You can take credit for not working out because you prioritized sleep. Right. It's not a right or wrong way to do it. It's just a matter of recognizing what represents even one step of growth for you. I love that. Yeah. All right. Take credit. That's number one. What's number two? Yeah. Okay. Number two is, so I, I mentioned the critic and the champion voices, right? The inner, we all kind of know our inner critic. Most yep. of us are the inner critic quite a bit, right? Kind of a loud voice. And um, most of us, it's like, we've not only handed that inner critic a megaphone, we've probably given them a microphone and like built in surround sound and subwoofers, right? It's a really loud voice. It dominates. And so a second practice in self-acceptance is to work on handing the microphone over to your champion or whatever you want to call it. That's what I use because the champion voice is in there too. 
Like my champion voice would say things like, um, I, I don't know. I, I, I think she kind of did okay in that meeting, don't you? And the critic was like, yeah, but, you know, critic always had a yeah, but yeah. to whatever the champion wanted to recognize. And so the way that you can conceptually think about elevating the voice of the champion, you can't fight them against each other. You cannot expect your champion to fight your critic. So the critic interrupts, right? Has the yeah, but kind of statement constantly pointing out the shortcomings or what's next. You want to actually leverage what the champion does so well, which is accept and cheerlead. So it's paradoxical and surprising for people that you actually want to accept your critic and regard your critic with kindness and love. Mm. And they'll amazingly like calm down. They quiet. Yeah. Down. I've heard, um, use, use them as a, as discernment, but not a judge. Okay. Yeah. And, and I think so, when you do that, like, sorry, were you going to say? No, no, no. Keep going. Well, cause I, I think when you can regard your critic with kindness and love and acceptance, it, it removes the judgment from what they're saying. Yeah. It's, it's just, just feedback. You know, yeah, it's just information. Just, you know, you kind of personify these voices in your own head <laughs> because this is about building a relationship with yourself. Your inner critic is a part of you. Yeah. It's a part of you. So self-acceptance as a practice means accepting that inner critic. And, and the beautiful thing is they calm down, man. It stops being like, yeah, but you didn't have that agenda ready to go. And because of that, there were two subjects you guys didn't even talk about. And it, right, oh my gosh, like the attitude and the tone and the just yeah. the judgment. But if you say, you know what, thank you for bringing that to my attention. Um, is there anything else that's important for me to know there? Probably the critic will be like, well, yeah. And you know, they'll see something else and you can say, thank you. That's really useful. Is there anything else that you want me to know there? And they'll go, no, that's it. <laughs> right? Like they'll be like, okay. And it might sound really goofy, right? But this as a practice, just it removes the negative power from the critic while yeah. holding on to that discerning ability of like, you know what? It might've been really useful if I had an agenda prepared because we could have chosen the topics more strategically. That's good. You want that kind of growth and awareness, but you don't have to beat the crap out of yourself in the process. Yeah. Is, is that conversation with you and your critic and your champion, is it that literal where you would stop and have that conversation? Like not just listen and hear the voices, <laughs> but like, do you stop and have those conversations? So I have, and I've also journaled about it. Like I'll give the critic, you know, uh, I'll give her control. Mine's a female. I'll give her control. I'll let her write out what it, what it is that she wants me to, to see and hear and know. And I don't try and fight her. I don't resist her. I just, I like put it there and then I, and then I see it and I'm like, okay. Is there anything yeah. else? But yeah, I did. I had that whole narrative between like the, you know, the champion and the critic where the champion was asking, you know, you know, you really, you've really been helpful. And I, I love how much you prevent Laura from making foolish mistakes. And it's so great that you want to help her. Um, I have some ideas too. Would it be okay with you if I also shared my thoughts with her sometimes? You know, and the critics like, that's amazing. Yeah, okay. <laughs> 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 yeah, I'm and I, I, you that's can find amazing. your own flavor, but yeah. Yeah. I'm yeah. glad you brought that up, but the not, cause I think that that would have been my innate reaction is all right. My champion's got to take out the critic. Like to, right? to like pit them against each other. Yeah. Right. Like we're going to win this. Mm -hmm. And so I love, I love that approach. All right. We're actually going to get to three things. So self-acceptance, take credit, elevate the champion. And number three. So number three is about how you behave toward yourself. So I'll, I'll give you an example. I'll give you a little story. So I, back in 2018, um, I did this program called remote year. I traveled around the world. I lived basically like 12 countries, 12 months. And so before that point, I was, I got rid of all my stuff or like 90% of my belongings, major purge. And one of the things that I noticed is that I had multiple scented candles that were only partially used, like just barely used. And I love scented candles. I especially love Christmas cookie by Yankee candle. Like that's my favorite. And <laughs> yep. I, I was like, I, I felt sad 
that I had all these partially used, kind of barely used candles. And I was reflecting on it. Like, I like these so much. What's the deal? How, how are these, they so unused? And I realized that I would only use them. I'd only light them if I was like having people over. But I'm the one that likes it. It's like I had made this decision in, you know, that year or whatever leading up to my travels that I wasn't worthy of lighting the candle. Like I had to save it, right? Yeah. I wasn't worthy of it. It's only something that I would do for other, which is even goofier because it's probably not everybody's jam, you know? Not everybody wants it to just smell like sugar, but I, I like it. And so I recognized that by behaving that way toward myself, by not allowing myself to do something for me, just for me, I was sending signals of not being enough right? Which is the opposite of what you want with self-acceptance. So I'm very proud to report that when I came back from my travels and I could have the scented candles, like I go through them like crazy, pretty much daily. I have them lit because I'm enough of a reason. Yeah. I do it for me. And so I, I invite you to think about what is that for you? That's good. My wife and I were just having this conversation. Yeah. Um, candles and cologne was the other thing we keyed on in on like, I love the way this smells, but I don't use it except yeah. for special occasions. Yes, exactly. And so I just, it's just about being intentional and just noticing, am I saving something with good reason or am I saving it because I'm somehow minimizing my own value or my own worth? Other goofy things like I would, when I would have people over, I would clean my home and I, I would look and I was like, this looks really nice. <laughs> <laughs> like, I really like this. And I'm like, gosh, what if I cleaned my home and like, not just clean, but like tidy up, you know, what if I just did that for me? And of course there's just oodles of science and research too, about the benefit of reducing clutter. And yeah, but I recognize that was another way that I wasn't doing it for me. I decided I wasn't enough of a reason. So I think just whatever you can find for yourself, it, it takes some of those things that feel a little bit cliche and puts it into the, the light of like, psychologically, here's what's happening. Like when people say, buy yourself flowers or, you know, make yourself a bubble bath. Like when people talk about doing that kind of stuff, it sounds cliche and maybe corny and find what's true for you. But it is a way for you to actually honor yourself and say like, I'm doing this for me, not for anybody else. I'm not waiting for anybody else to do it for me, but I am going to treat myself in that high regard. That's so beautiful. I want to end just on that because it's both powerful and practical along with all those other three bullet points on self acceptance. I had no idea where we we're going today. So this was super fun. <laughs> um, <laughs> I hope you felt the same, but tell, oh, um, sure. if, if people want to find out more about you, get your book, you're a speaker, you're a consultant, where do they find you? They can find me at gallaheredge.com and it is Gallagher, not Gallagher. Gallagher is like way more common of a spelling, but there's no second G. I did actually buy that domain too, but yeah, Gallagher Edge can learn more about the All book, right. the speaking and our, our leadership development programs. All right. Well, if they don't want to mistype it, it'll be in the show notes. <laughs> Laura, so appreciate having you on such a fun conversation. Thanks for being here. Yeah. Thank you for having me. System and soul. We'll see you next week.